thanks, Elaine. Um, thanks for inviting me over and to um, get together on a very nice uh, sunny morning. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I think I'm, I said to Elaine just before, I feel like I'm talking to the pre I'm preaching to the um, converted. Um, but this is sort of, if you think of it as a way of understanding pre-registration um, and not sort of the practical aspects, which I'll say for the workshop tomorrow, um, hopefully we can generate some discussion from this. Uh, <coughs> uh, so I, I, as a matter of transparency, I have some conflicts of interest. Um, I have received funding from the Berkeley Initiative for Transparency in the Social Sciences. Um, I'm also a catalyst like Elaine, um, and I received some funding from most of my salaries funded by the uh, Australian uh, National Health and Medical Research Council. So some of what, what I say would be coloured by some of this. So the plan is to uh, sort of outline the standard model for science and the problems that go with it and um, present pre-registration as a simple solution, a simple but powerful solution to uh, mitigating some of those problems. And we're going to try to imagine two worlds, one with pre-registration and one without pre-reg. And um, I'm going to go through some concerns about pre-registering. Um, and I'll finish off with a story of two early career researchers. So we all know this. Uh, it's probably general to most uh, fields that you, you work in. Uh, we generate a, a hypothesis, you know, lying in bed, <laughs> on the bus, whatever, and then we go to, to the office and we talk with our colleagues. <coughs> we generate a uh, design, a study. Uh, we go out into the field, into the hospitals, wherever you go. We collect data. We bring the data in. We analyse it with the most appropriate model. We interpret the results and then hopefully we publish it to um, disseminate our work. It can go wrong though um, and sometimes very, very wrong and um, <clears throat> pre-registration is a way of fixing some of those problems that I'll try and outline. So we've already heard about hypothesizing after the results arcing. What happens here is that we generate the hypothesis, do the study, analyze it, we interpret the results, and we go, oh, that's actually not what we kind of wanted. It's not the result that fits my bias. So we go back and we generate a new one. So that's called harking. And you do all of that before you actually publish the results. So that's the key point, that we don't get to see the original hypothesis and the result to that original hypothesis. We, we see something that's skewed. And we see similar problems, and they've got different sorts of names. Uh, again, we do the study, look at the results, and we change bits of the design. Maybe the data, we collect more data, or we drop an outlier. We start off with a linear model, but we then fit a quadratic, whatever. Uh, <coughs> and then we get some different results, and then we publish that finding. So this is a, not a scientific approach to science. This is a artistic approach to science. You can see what happens. We see a result that we don't quite want. We don't publish it. Change the hypothesis. We get it a little bit better, but we still don't publish it because it's not exactly what we want. And we do the same again, and we alter the, the design of the study. Still not what we want. Get more data. Still not what we want. Different model. Now we get what we want. So this is very simplistic, right? And uh, it's just to create, an, create a narrative. But <coughs> the problem is that we get a whole bunch of findings that we don't get to see. And we get this skewed representation of our original hypothesis um, that pretends to be confirmatory and not exploratory. Because all of this, what we're do, doing here, that's an exploratory, ex, that's, we're exploring. Uh, it's not confirming the original hypothesis. Uh, <clears throat> and the damage that this uh, inflicts on the scientific community is that 
we get a big selection of findings that pretend to be confirmatory when they are, in fact, exploratory. And this starts to induce bias and it misleads the public. It stifles reproducibility, it increases waste, uh, and ultimately, I think it undermines the credibility of science. Uh, and these black ones are here, sort of the chance findings that we get, get when people actually stick to the original hypothesis and test and report their original hypothesis. And by chance, we might get a few of those, but the majority is this mouldy, sort of skewed uh, data or results. So around the 1960s, around 1960s uh, Robert Rosenthal, who's a psychologist, I think, um, he provided a, a simple but effective um, strategy to prevent some of these problems. And um, more recently, the open science movement from Brian Nozak, Chris Chambers, and David Muller has sort of brought this into light and have really actioned it, I think. Uh, so what is it? It's a research plan that's time-stamped read-only and created before data collection. So I'm just going to go through each bit. It's time-stamped, and this is key because we can't manipulate time. Well, yeah, we can't. <laughs> <coughs> so we need to record the time at which we set the hypothesis and the date at which the entire group of the scientists uh, finalise the plan. It's read-only, so we can't do anything to it after it's been time-stamped, so it can't be modified. And hopefully, in most cases, it's done before we collect data, because once we start collecting data, we get to see what the data's like, and we get to go back and modify things. Uh, it's not to say that you can't pre-register after you start collecting data. You can still do that, but that's not the most powerful form of a pre-register registered study. The most powerful form is, sorry, the most effective form, I think, is when you do it before data collection. So what does it include? Um, and I know you all work in different disciplines, so um, naturally the answer to that is it depends. Um, there are specific and tailored pre-registration forms for, uh, say, original investigations, systematic reviews, uh, secondary analyses, qualitative studies now. There was a pub paper publi published a couple of weeks ago on pre-registering qualitative studies and something on <coughs> neuroimaging because they have different nuances. Um, but the core items that should really go into a pre-registered study is that you set your hypothesis, you define how you're going to collect your data and from who you're going to collect your data from. Uh, you set your independent and dependent variables um, and the models that you're going to use and the assumptions that go with the, uh, the design and the analysis. And then you set your inference criteria. Um, so all of these tailored examples will have some form of uh, these core items um, in embedded. So, okay. If we go back to the process of uh, process of generating evidence, um, pre-registration falls here, right before data collection, and it prevents us from hacking, p-hacking, and selective reporting. And these things, they're not always intentional. And we of often think that it's like this bad thing that people do, that they go back and hack. But it's... It's a problem with our memory sometimes. It's, you know, we do all of these things unintentionally. And um, I just feel like sometimes the, these things are uh, tagged as things that we're intentionally doing. But they're not, off, not always intentional. So, uh, yeah, pre-registration is one form of, uh, one way of mitigating those solutions. But... We've heard before from the back, registered reports, they're a better solution um, because what it does is that mm. there is, there's a two-staged peer review process. Um, you create your pre-registration, 
that gets sent out to peer reviewers before you collect the data and you get a sort of a tick of approval as in you know if you do the study in the way that you specified and if you test the hypothesis that you intended to test we're going to publish that result uh, sorry I think we have got the wrong slides I think two seconds Is that where I go to, sorry, the file in the, uh, uh, that w the one that was in the, uh, We get conditional acceptance of, of the paper before we get to the final stage of presenting our results. Uh, they're becoming a lot more popular now. So <coughs> it started off from this journal called Cortex. Now 169. I checked this two days ago. Um, they're now accepting pre-registered um, registered reports. Um, yeah, again, so the good things are that it keeps, you know, it, it ensures that the original hypothesis and the test of that original hypothesis ends up being published and any deviations from the process it becomes explicit because you can compare um, and you get your paper published regardless of whether you know you found a significant result how novel the finding is the potential impact of those findings and <clears throat> it does also protect us from the reviewer's input because the reviewers are also, if, if it's not a registered report, they get to see the data, right? Um, so you get protected from all of these things. One key thing that I think is often missed in these sort of educational things about pre-registration is what you do after you pre-register the study is um, it, it, it's not essential, but it helps to link um, back to the original pre-registration that you made um, and outline any deviations. So we plan to do so-and-so as outlined in our link, but we had to do this because, and there are all often legitimate reasons for doing, you know, making these devi deviations. Um, and the key thing here is that we separate our findings of the results that we get from the pre-registered study and any exploratory analyses that we do. And it's key that we report all of the uh, pre-registered hypotheses. Because if you don't do that, there's no point in you know, pre-specifying. So let's try and see how this plays out in two different worlds. So one, the old world, let's say, where we are free to hack, free to p-hack and whatever, and the new world where everyone, every scientist is deemed to you know, mandated to pre-register their work. <laughs> and we've seen this before. We get a bunch of findings that, um, that pretend to be confirmatory but are exploratory. And we get, by chance, a few studies that stuck to their original hypothesis. When we start to introduce pre-registration, you hypothesize and you get, you know, and you do the study and you separate out your confirmatory and exploratory analyses. And hopefully the confirmed analysis, confirmatory analyses that goes on to get replicated by some other group. And the exploratory findings, they generate a new hypothesis. And that new hypothesis gets pre-registered. And this process keeps going. So you can kind of see how things will play out. <clears throat> and we get a very different picture if we implement pre-registration to the entire world. Uh, we get a bunch of findings that we declare as exploratory, okay, so we can be a little bit skeptical about those. And we get the original confirmatory results from the original uh, hypotheses. And that means we can have a bit more faith and credibility attached to these findings compared to these ones. And before when we had this picture, 
we don't know how much faith to how much belief we should have in these green studies, the mouldy ones. So I think the key point is that it does help us differentiate what, we, what the confirmatory and exploratory findings are. <coughs> There's some supporting evidence to suggest that this actually works in the real world. There's a bunch of uh, studies across disciplines and it reports a proportion of papers that report a positive finding. When I say positive, meaning it supports the original hypothesis. And you can see here, for example, in psychology, it's around 90%. So if you only look at published data. But new findings have shown that if, you, if we only look at registered reports, the number of uh, fi the number of studies that reject the null or the number of studies that um, don't support the original hypothesis they go they, they increase in size in volume some people have con you know there are legitimate concerns about pre-registering your work so if you pre-register and, lo and not present your results Will other people take your idea and you know run with it? But when you pre-register, your claim and your theory and your hypothesis, they're all time stamped, so they become verifiable, and they date, they tie to that date, um, and it's possible to embargo your pre your pre-registration, especially on a open science framework put it under embargo for four years so it's not open to the public but when you come to present your results you can open it up um, so that's one way of getting around this uh, idea of uh, you know this concern about um, getting scooped does it add to the workload I'd argue it does not it makes it simpler um, this tweet summarizes it very nicely So do the hard work when you plan the study and everything else after it becomes a breeze. We often have contingencies in the analysis that in, a, in the design and analyses that we want to do in our studies. So um, we're sometimes concerned how many of these contingencies can we build into a pre-registered plan. Um, <coughs> you know, if it's very complex, you know, it can be difficult, but it is possible to specify um, the decisions that you're going to make along the way. So this is a snapshot of an example that I used when, when we pre-registered a, a secondary analysis of a trial. Um, we said, if the intervention did have a causal effect on the outcome, we're going to do this. And if it didn't have a causal effect on the outcome, we're going to do something else. And we built those decisions in prior to seeing the data. And when the data came in and when it came to analysing it, it made it very easy for us to you know, work through the process. There wasn't much thinking involved you know, later on because we had done the thinking prior. Uh, there's this concern that it doesn't uh, let us explore. Um, <coughs> obviously, science wouldn't progress if we just did confirmatory analyses and didn't generate more hypotheses through uh, exploration. But it doesn't stop people from exploring. It only makes it explicit when you do explore. So we're just trying to separate out the exploration from the confirmation. And this is a very good read if you're concerned about this problem of uh, uh, pre-registering. Uh, <coughs> yeah, it, this paper, it really talks about what we had kind of discussed before in our interactive session, and it really says that uh, there's a natural selection of bad science going on, and you have to hack to survive, you have to publish in the big journals to survive, you have to p-hack to survive and all this, and those things are like genes and they get passed on from supervisor to you know, early career researchers and so on and so on. 
And it's, it just takes a Darwinian perspective on how these bad practices are disseminated throughout science. And the problem is, you know, how does pre-registration pre fit in to the system of natural selection of bad science? If you pre-register and do good science, do you get selected out? So just to illustrate that point, I'm going to go through two potential scenarios, so completely <laughs> fictional. Um, I've got your very own Bono and Morrissey from the Smiths. They're both equally bright. They've got PhDs in environmental ep epidemiology. They've secured postdocs at Yale. Equally hardworking, work in the same lab. They're equally unhealthy. Uh, they like telling stories. And ultimately, they have good intentions, so they want to do good science that's robust. That's the important bit. They, they, they mean well. Ten years later, Prof. Morrissey, he's got tenured, he's tenured at Yale. Uh, he's published 200 plus papers, all in high ranking journals, 50,000 citations, lots of money, and he's very proud of his career. Uh, Dr. Bono, on the other hand, he's still a postdoc, he works for Prof. Morrissey, he's published 20 papers, you know, and he's rethinking, he's going, what am I doing? Because he's not surviving. What went wrong for Dr. Bono is that he pre-registered all of his studies, whereas you know, Morrissey just went along with the usual system. And this is obviously counterintuitive to what I'm saying. I'm, you know, I'm trying to tell you to <laughs> pre-register your work, and, I'm <laughs> and, you th and you're seeing that it's just going to have a detrimental effect on your careers. Uh, but as we were discussing before, I think, I think we're seeing a change in the world, so I wouldn't be too, I wouldn't think that this is completely counterintuitive. So if we consider a world that rewards sloppy bad science, and Morrissey's published all of these mouldy findings and one probably believable finding, Bonner's published one mouldy finding by chance, and he's pre-registered so he's got three credible findings. Morrissey's uh, contributing a lot to a world of sloppy science. Bono's only contributing one. But he get, he's the one that gets rewarded, right, <coughs> with all the mouldy results. If we consider a different world where we have, where, where people are rewarding, funders and institutions are rewarding uh, good science, from the small number of papers that Bono's presented, he's you know, he's done pretty well. And he's, Morrissey's contributing one. Okay. So ideally, that's the world that we want to go to. But I think we're in a, in a flux. I think we're in a system where we're shifting from the red to the blue. Um, and I, on a daily basis, I struggle with uh, thinking about how I'm going to satisfy both worlds. Because I have to satisfy that world to survive, right? I have to publish, I have to get the big journals, you know, the big papers, I have to attract funding, and I ha I'm subservient to this world that's uh, rewarding bad science. But at the, time, at the same time, I have to split my time, you know, time and resources to contribute to this world. And I don't know, hopefully this creates a bit of discussion around uh, how we can navigate this problem, you know, during this transition phase. Um, yeah, and that's, I think we, you know, we're, we're all responsible to uphold robust and good science. Um, some of us are failing us, you know, but at the end of the day, I think, um, not being subservient to that world will help us keep that up, you know. Uh, that's my interpretation, but you might have different views on that. Uh, if you're interested in pre-registration and how to do it, um, there'll be a workshop tomorrow. Um, so I'm going to be talking about where you can register your work depending on what kind of work you do. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about 
the procedural aspects of doing that on Open Science Framework, and um, we'll have an interactive session on trying to pre-register a hypothetical study. Is to have open science notebooks, right, which is what I and some others do. Um, and you could say that after you pre registered, you actually open an open notebook that everybody can see, and this is actually your record of the experiment. Now, obviously, we've got caveats with personal data and things like that. Um, it's quite a brave step to take, but I have found it a very positive one. It actually makes my science better and quicker. Uh, are there people who are doing that in this area? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Um, not, in, not in my field, at least. Right. Um, I have seen, you know, you know, uploading code and things on GitHub and so on, but not, not throughout the entire process. I think that's what you're describing. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Data, code, narrative, everything. Live, right. Yeah. I've not seen that. Because it means that you do your checks every day or every week against yeah. your pre-registration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if after, let's say, a month, you're actually not doing it properly, it can be spotted. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point, because yeah. it's all well and good pre-registering, right? But sticking to that plan is a second challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering what kind of, like, protections is there in place, though, for researchers who pre-register their studies and then someone comes and steals their idea? Because, like, I knew a girl and she did a she registered a systematic review protocol and then happened to go on a year's absence and when she came back the surgeons in the US had gone and done her systematic review and there was not like it was part of her PhD and there was nothing she could do. So I was just wondering like what actually is there to protect us? And the the surgeon's review didn't acknowledge or any no. you know, it didn't go back to the original. No. Yeah. I mean it is a caveat to put out your ideas out put your ideas out there. Um, and that is a risk, you know, an inherent risk that you take. But for the benefit of it, I think the benefit of it outweighs that individual um, detriment of, you know, one researcher being superseded by another. Although that, on an individual level, that is detrimental to the to the researcher. I think on a greater scale, I think as a you know, looking at science in general. I think that outperforms that individual detriment. But I don't think I answered your question. You, your question was, are there any, is there any protection? Yeah. And to that, I don't have an answer, sorry. You know, you know the embargoes you mentioned open, I, went, I was wondering just about, because I hadn't actually really thought about the embargoes, because I was thinking, oh, it ha all has to be open, but the embargoes are an interesting kind of thing because it's kind of being a little bit closed to protect yourself, maybe, to be open later on. Yeah. Is that something that, I don't know. I I mean, know. Yeah, if your friend had, him, had put the registration under embargo, that wouldn't have happened, right? Yeah. I think but it is, but is there less different? transparent, yeah. in a way. Yeah, I think with, with that case, one of the things, like it was on Prospero, so it was open yeah, yeah, access yeah. Was a thing. Yeah. Like if it was OSF, it wouldn't have. But then yeah. part of the whole point of putting things on Prospero is that you're trying to make sure that it's not currently being done and that no one can do it. Yeah. I think there's, there's a question kind of about power as well for, for graduate students. Like, you know, if we're pre-registering stuff like that are public, you know, that if someone who is a lot further down, who has who is much more established kind of in their career, it's much more difficult to, to challenge them on it. I think that it is. You know, if it was just another graduate student, or, or if we were probably more established too. Yeah. But I mean, there are option. In a way, there are opportunities for collaboration in that way. So if 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 somebody else is thinking in a very similar line, and they spot your pre-registration or your idea, there is a way of connecting and building something bigger from that. But I get it from an individual perspective that it is challenging to uh, and risky to put those ideas out there. So, yeah. It kind of seems strange that they, they would, I mean, maybe it's, I'm just naive, like, but it kind of seems strange that you would take a registered Prospero protocol and then go do the exact same review. Obviously, that's what happens. Yeah. It seems unusual logic to do that as opposed to 
be interested in other things. Yeah. Oh, this is going on. I'm also interested. But did they look at the first census? Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. we can have yeah. quite yeah. close as well. I don't think they looked at. Uh, yeah. They don't think they looked at our prosper. I think they just happen to have the same idea as well. Yeah. Yeah. For the sewer experience that we have with prosper, whereby we registered in full and it was quite transparent in reporting compared to some of the um, pieces of sea on this barrel aren't actually that well reported. Yeah. And um, in the time that it took us to do the ITD review, it took us about 18 months from the time we started and had a look at the protocol to the time we submitted for publication. In that time, three evidence instances met its pieces on the same research question that overlapped quite significantly in a conceptual manner published in different journals. They hadn't been uploaded. The reason that we uploaded ours was to be transparent for one, but then also to see if anything else was doing, if anyone else was doing something similar. Mm. Um, had we identified that there was even just one systematic review in the area, there's no way we would have done a systematic review for the purpose of avoiding research waste. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just disappointing. Yeah. It probably speaks to the whole nature of like how everyone needs to see try and kind of push for this kind of thing. Because like we had a master's student who, you know, really wanted to publish a really good systematic review and we were going to help her to do it. But in the year that she had graduated and gone back to look at it, the, pretty much the exact same review, just one extra study was published and you feel that, like God that's a waste of time and resource. But I guess it probably happens when things aren't transparent more so that those things are more common. Biggest defence is moving faster than your company. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wonder, that, Peter, if uh, the notebooks could help in this case. So I think so, yes. You, you get a live view of how far the other, let's say, for discussion's sake, competitive researchers are at their, you know, in their progress. The so more you can show publicly, the better the defence is. Now, whether the community accepts your claim. Yeah. Uh, I think there are two places where you can get this. One is the idea, and ideas are very volatile, right? So, you know, um, publishing, you know, the pre-registration is probably something which, unless it's very unusual, somebody else might do anyway. The place where I think it's really pernicious is in the reviewing. So when you get a manuscript which is reviewed, uh, where the process takes months where the thing is rejected, sent back for whatever, and then you find out that somebody else has published the work. So there's suspicion that if you have something out there which says, I have done this work, it's harder for that, and a journal will have a case to answer if somebody does do this. Thanks a lot.